I invite you to kneel. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted, even as many were amazed at him. So marred was his look beyond human semblance, and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom was, has the arm of of the Lord been revealed. He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmary, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth, oppressed and condemned. He was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, no, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death, and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many, and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to refine grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got out a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. 
Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold, and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and asked about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this, is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of Jesus' disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. They then brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium, in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, we do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death that he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own? Or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, 
And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called the stove pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, him on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there, whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the Spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross of the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph's, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, 
asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths, along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So um, when I was growing up, there were a number of TV shows or movies uh, that were centered around the idea of this person who was in, the, the line was always this, it was, uh, they were accused of a crime they did not commit. Um, it, he was accused of a crime he did not commit. So he was on the run, basically trying to clear his name. And it was this cool show, it was kind of like The Fugitive, it was, it was one of those examples, that movie. Um, and and this, obviously, that being accused of something they didn't do, accused of a crime they didn't commit. Um, obviously, that, that happens in real life too. We know sometimes there's, Incredible stories, uh, when I say incredible, not awesome incredible, just, just powerful stories of people who were falsely accused, even those who were falsely found guilty, who then did everything they, everything they could to clear their name. And it's just those remarkable stories of the failure of the justice system at times. But we, we, that, that's the, the idea behind this is we recognize that justice is good, justice is necessary, right? If I've been falsely accused, I, I should fight to clear my name. If I've been falsely accused, I, I, should, I should fight for justice. In fact, um, that's what you deserve. The definition of justice is uh, getting that, receiving the good that is owed to you or offering the good that you owe someone else. Like that, it's all, it's all necessary. It's really, really important. Which is why I think one of the reasons you and I can be so defensive when we're falsely accused of something. Now, yes, there's the people who are like accused of something in their criminal charges or in a TV show or in a movie where they're falsely accused, but there's something in us, right, that can get really ramped up when we're falsely accused of something, and, or when someone, someone thinks we did something that we didn't do, or they don't know the whole story about this thing, and so they, they're believing things about us that aren't necessarily true. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but um, when, those, when that happens, you can, it's really easy to feel really powerless. It's really easy in those moments to have the desire to be so defensive, right? That desire can be so strong, and, and it's not a wrong desire, right? It's actually a good desire, right? Because it's truth. Um, the church even says we have a right to legitimate self-defense, and if someone has gotten something about us wrong, it makes sense that we would be defensive. It makes sense that we would want to clear our name. It makes sense that I, I'd want to explain, right? That's, that's what we want to do, right? If, if everyone's ever accused you of something or they think like, oh, yeah, you're the person who did such and such, you realize, and I didn't do that. We want to explain, like we want to clarify, we want to justify. Um, we want to basically say, I'm not guilty. Like, I'm not guilty of what you think I'm guilty of. I did not do the thing that you think I did. Um, and again, if that's ever happened to you, I know whenever that's happened to me, I just, it's so interesting. I just kind of do some introspective kind of like thoughts of when, when someone thinks something about me, I can have the tendency to go in my head, right? And I have all these arguments that go in my head of like how I'm just like, no, I'm like, I'm right and that's wrong and I never did this. And I have this tendency to become so self-righteous um, because the desire, right, is so strong. It's like, I didn't do this. I didn't do this thing that you think I did. Yeah, I just, I don't know. The most, the most recent time that happened to me, I guess there's no other way to describe it other than I felt really self-righteous. Because you got this wrong. I've never done anything like this. Um, and I was, I was like, because I'm not guilty. And I didn't do this thing. And I, and, but I stopped myself and I was in prayer because I was going through these arguments in prayer. Sometimes that happens, right? We're just like fighting with this imaginary person in your head. And pretty soon I realized, like, oh my gosh, I had a flash to this moment in the story of the Passion, right? In the movie, the, the Passion of Christ, right? We know that in the Gospel, not, this is not highlighted in John's Gospel, but as Jesus is given his cross and he's walking, carrying that cross from, Caiaphas, or from Pilate's palace to Golgotha, he falls. And so what did the Romans do? The Romans forced Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. And in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, there's this moment, it's just, it's so, it's, so powerful where you get Simon of Cyrene, he's being forced to carry the cross of Jesus. And he says, okay, fine, I'll do this. I'll carry the cross because you're forcing me to. But I need you all to remember that I'm an innocent man who's being forced to carry the cross of a condemned man. Right? And that, that sense of like, you all need to know this. 
that I'm gonna carry this cross, but I'm not guilty. I didn't do whatever this guy did. He's the guilty one. You need to know that I'm the innocent one. And I realized, man, as often as or I'm falsely accused of something, or when any of us are falsely accused of something, that's, that's, that's the voice that says, I need you to know. I'm not guilty of this. I'm an innocent. But the, the clear truth is this. The clear truth is even, is, is worse. The clear truth is, I'm not guilty of what you might think. But that doesn't mean that I'm not guilty. That Simon of Cyrene, here in the movie at least, saying, you all need to know that I'm an innocent man being forced to carry the cross of a condemned man, condemned man. That is, the irony is intentional. Because just because I'm not guilty of this doesn't mean I'm not guilty. And that, that sense of, you know, when any of us, any of us could have a reputation destroyed by a, a false accusation, right? Or a false claim that you did X, Y, or Z. Um, you say, yeah, what you think about my heart or about my past is not true. But then to really take that moment and stop and say, wait, but if you knew my actual past, if you knew my actual heart, it might not be any better. See, here at Newman, I know, thank you for being part of the virtual front pew, but here on campus at UMD, we have this kind of these three words that we repeat again and again. They're on our shirts, they're on stickers, and the, the three words are seen, known, loved. Because students come to campus and there's thousands and thousands of people and it's really, really easy to feel unseen. It's really, really easy to be unknown. It's really easy to be far, far from the people who actually love you. And so we want to, as a community, we want to, we want to become, we're not always perfect at this, you want to become the kind of community that actually sees and knows and loves. And that's, and because that's a longing, that's the longing of the human heart. But even that, if we think about it, sure, I want to be seen, I want to be known, but the things that I want you to see and the things I want you to know are only the things I'm proud of. I actually don't want you to see the stuff I'm ashamed of. I actually don't want you to know what I'm ashamed of. And that's, I think that's all of us, right? But the question is like, why? why why do we have such a fear of acknowledging, yeah, I'm guilty, right? Again, I might not be guilty of what you think I'm guilty of, but I am guilty. Why is there such a fear in our hearts? Why is there such a fear in our culture of being guilty? I think there's at least three contributing, contributing factors in our culture when it comes to this. I think the first thing is um, that in our culture, there's no objective standard, right? There's no, there's no actual clear, like, this is right, this is wrong, always. Because it's constantly changing. Our, our culture is very relativistic, right? So there's no clear objective standard. It's kind of like whatever the fad is right now, whatever trending. And basically, be careful because your tweets might age badly. That kind of idea that at any moment, um, the tides can change and you thought you were doing well? <laughs> False. You were wrong. And there's this relativism that kind of just seeps into everything. And so who knows? Maybe you think you're doing fine one day, but the next day you're being accused of what yesterday people thought was fine. So there's relativism. The second thing is how, the, the maximum emphasis on perception we have, right? So no one really know, no one really knows someone through the internet. No one really can know someone through uh, uh, social media or even through the media. We just think we know someone. We just perceive things about people. I mean, think about the last time you had someone that you actually knew. You truly, you know, you lived in their in their life. You're part of their life. You love them. You know them. And there was some kind of thing that someone got wrong about them or they didn't go to the whole story. The willingness you had to be able to say, wait, let's slow down quick before, before I jump to conclusions. Let, let me get this straight. It's not just perception. It's like, actually, I know the depth of this person's heart. So I'm not just going to allow my perception to be completely altered by this accusation because I know this person. And so, again, why are we so afraid of guilt in our culture? I think one, it's no objective standard in our culture of relativism. Secondly, I mean, it's all perception. And because of that, there's no room for grace. That's the third thing. There's no room for mercy. There's, there's, there's no room for forgiveness. There's basically, we live in a culture where there's only conditional love. That's it. That you have to earn love everywhere you go. That I have to earn love everywhere I go. So in a culture where there is no real right or wrong, no objective standard, where there's all perception and not the depth of our person's heart and the complexity of being a human being in this world, and there's no grace offered, that you fail, you're out, you're disqualified, you're canceled. In that kind of world, you have to defend yourself. In that, in that kind of world, we have to explain ourselves. In that kind of world, you have to justify ourselves. In that kind of world, we have to deny any kind of sense of guilt. I'm not guilty and I have to be afraid of being guilty until until we realize who's on the cross next to us. 
That's the thing is, is we, our lives can be dominated by this defensiveness, by this, this desire to justify, by this self-righteousness, by this fear of guilt until we realize who is on the cross next to us, that Jesus is there on the cross and he actually is the innocent one. That he does see, not just the great parts, he sees all of us. That he does know not just the, our wins, he even knows our wounds. That here's our God on the cross next to us and he knows all of it, he sees all of it and he still loves us. In fact, this is, this is the kernel, the, the, the core of the gospel, right? right? St. Paul writing to the Romans, chapter five. It says, God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That we basically, the innocent died for the guilty. And this is, this is the world-altering good news. You and I are guilty. That's it. Maybe not of what other people think, but you and I are guilty. And the consequence of our sin is death. This is something that we don't often hear. We're not often reminded of this. But the consequence of the sins that you and I do not just like the consequence of the sins that like serial killers do or the consequence of sins that Hitler did, but the consequence of your sins is death. The consequence of my sins is death. Right? Isaiah wrote about this 600 years before Jesus. Isaiah wrote in chapter 53, he said, We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the guilt of all of us. The Lord has laid upon him, who is ultimately Jesus, the guilt of all of us. And if I deny that I'm guilty, then I'm denying the fact that I have a Savior. And as long as I'm trying to justify myself or explain myself or defend myself, I'm keeping Jesus at an arm's length. I think it's only when we stop trying to justify ourselves, when we stop trying to defend ourselves, stop trying to keep, keep hold on to self-righteousness and just simply acknowledge the fact that I'm guilty. Can this whole thing we do, we're doing make a difference in our lives? When we think about this is, what, this is what happens in Luke's gospel, right? In Luke's gospel during the Passion on the cross, what happens, there's two thieves on either side of Jesus, right? Two criminals on either side of Jesus. And the one's reviling him. The other one says this. He says these words that are so powerful. He basically says, he says, have you no fear of God. <clears throat> For you're subject to the same punishment. And indeed, we have been condemned justly. For the sentence we have received corresponds to our crimes. But this one has done nothing wrong. Now, consider how, what a profound statement this is. This man... And we call him the good thief, but he was not a good guy. I think this is so important for us to understand. We've been to mention this before. The good thief, he's not a good person. Why? Because he's experiencing the worst form of capital punishment. He's experiencing the worst form of torture and death. And he's basically acknowledging, yeah, I deserve this. You know, this is the secret of every one of the saints. And this is, this is the thing that we in our modern culture have lost. Every one of the saints, when they're going through something difficult, they were ultimately saying, I might not have deserved this. This might be unjust. Like I might, this might actually not be what, um, this might not be fair. But they would then say, but I deserve, fall, I deserve far worse. Every one of the saints, no matter how bad their life was, say, yep, yeah, this isn't fair. This isn't just, but I deserve worse than this. The consequence of my sin is death. The consequence of this good thief's, good thief's life, his choices, was crucifixion. And when he told that truth, the truth, that like actually I'm guilty, and then, then the next line is, then he turns to Jesus. And this is the most important thing. Not just I acknowledge my guilt. Not just I'm not going to try to defend myself or explain myself or justify myself, but yes, I'm guilty. I've, I've received what I'm receiving, what I'm getting right now. It's the least that I deserve. Then he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is the truth is as long as I keep defending myself or trying to justify myself, the cross of Jesus, the, the sacrifice of Jesus, the love of Jesus will make no difference in my life. Because it has nothing to do with me. The love of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, that's for sinners. That's for those who are guilty. But if I am willing and have the courage to admit that I am guilty, that I actually need the cross, 
that I need this sacrifice, that I need this love, then my life, then your life, then our life will never be the same. This is Good Friday for a reason. It is Good Friday not because the thing that happened on this day was good, but because this day changed, changed the hope of sinners. Just like Isaiah said, we had, all, we had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But on this day, the Lord laid upon him the guilt of all of us. So what do I need to do? I need to stop defending myself. I need to stop trying to justify myself. I need to stop pretending that I'm not guilty so that the love of Jesus Christ actually has a place in my life. When Good Friday was declared, when Good Friday was proclaimed, when it was preached to the world, a world that had walked in darkness and it was wondering, is there any hope for someone like me, was given the definitive answer. The answer is absolutely yes. That I'm not loved just because of my wins. I'm loved even in my wounds. That I'm not wanted just because I've succeeded. I'm actually even wanted when I've failed. That I'm not part of this family or this group of people. I'm not part of you because I'm innocent. I've been brought into this family because I am guilty. And I am loved. And that's the good news of Good Friday. I am guilty. And I am loved. Brothers and sisters, I invite us to, to stand as we come before the Lord, praying for the needs of the church throughout the world, praying for the needs of our nations, praying for the needs of our families, praying for the needs of people throughout the entire world. Let us kneel. Let us stand. We pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us kneel. Let us stand. And let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, who by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by, by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our Bishop Daniel, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. <clears throat> Let us stand. <clears throat> Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide their ears and inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, 
that having received the forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith of, and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and to keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for the Jewish people, to whom our Lord, the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in the love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, Graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, so that in glad, so that, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and the Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that through the whole, throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray, dearly beloved, 
to God, the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that they all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress. 
as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that part, by partaking of this mystery, we may live a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessings, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people, who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, Comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.